Eric, thanks for providing our music this morning. This room feels good today. Do you feel it? Well, good morning. Good morning. It's good to be back. I hope your holidays were wonderful. My spouse, Ree, and I just returned from El Paso, Texas, Ree's hometown where we celebrated Christmas and last weekend, my sister-in-law's wedding. It was a beautiful Catholic ceremony complete with music by a traditional mariachi band <laughs> and a Mexican Catholic ritual I'd never seen before, the lassoing of the bride and groom. <laughs> which is essentially tying the couple together in what looks like a huge set of rosary beads. Has anybody ever seen this before? Yeah. It's really beautiful. I've been lucky to have spent a lot of time in El Paso over the last eight years since I met Ree. And if you've never been to El Paso, it's a beautiful desert city, right up against the Mexican border and the city of Juarez. In fact, the cities are so on top of each other that at night, this amazing thing happens. You stop being able to see the border wall, and the lights of El Paso and Juarez blend together and make them look like one city. It harkens back to a time before heightened border security, before nearby detention centers separated children from their parents back to a time when people could freely cross back and forth over the border to visit their family and go to work. As a white girl from New England, marrying into a Mexican Catholic family has been an eye-opening experience for me. Before I met Ree, I was largely uneducated about race and had almost no experience being in close relationship with people of color. Early on in our relationship, I remember finding a passport card in Reed's wallet. And I commented that I'd never seen a passport card before, that I was used to the booklet. But Reed explained to me that when you live on the border and you're a Mexican-American, it's a good idea to always be able to prove that you are an American citizen in case Border Patrol questions you. Because if you can't prove that you are a citizen on the spot, then you can be deported. This happens. I had no idea. Since then, I have been heartbroken, watching my mother-in-law, who struggles with health problems, endure a horrible health care system that is all too common for communities of color. Now I understand why we became a doctor. And I could barely believe the slurs thrown at my spouse by emboldened racists following the 2016 election. I'd heard the words before, but if I'm honest with myself, it's the first time those words actually hurt me. Over the years, I have come to learn the hard way that I enjoy a relative sense of safety and comfort that my spouse does not know. And my spouse knows fear and oppressions that I do not know. And then something happened this August that has sadly made me learn this lesson in an even deeper way. And I want to warn you that I'm going to brief, briefly speak about a mass shooting. On August 3rd of this year, a man with white nationalist and anti-immigrant Views drove nine hours from Allen, Texas to a busy El Paso Walmart 
to kill Mexicans. He ended up taking the lives of 22 people. This was a Walmart that Rhee and I had been to before. This was a Walmart that my sister-in-law had almost gone to that morning to get things for her engagement party planned for that afternoon. The shooter intentionally spared the lives of white people, of people who look like me, and shot at people who look like my family. So you bet that hit me hard. I love my spouse, I love my family. We walk through this world shoulder to shoulder. And we live in different realities. You may not be able to relate to my story exactly, but I think most, if not all of us, in this room move through the world with some sort of privilege whether it be our race, gender, sexuality, economic status, immigration status, something. And we know that feeling in the pit of our stomach that we enjoy a privilege that someone we care about does not. Friends, it is 2020. And yes, the stakes are high. But as we start this year, we must be present to the fact the stakes are not the same for each of us. Some of us were able to see a doctor last year, and some of us were not. Some of us could with relative ease make our rent or mortgage payment this week, and some of us could not. Some of us fear being the victim of a hate crime. And some of us do not. And for me personally, as I enter into this critical year, I carry with me this hard truth and I'll ask you to discern if it applies to you too. That because of the color of my skin, my education, my profession. If this country doesn't change this year, if we don't take major steps to reform the oppressive systems of racial and economic inequality this year, I'll probably be just fine. After all, privilege is when the system is built for you. But some of us need the world to change right now. Some people in this room, in our state, in our country, are fighting for their lives. But I believe there is one thing that is at stake for everyone in this room, especially those who enjoy relative physical and financial security. It's our faith, our soul, our spirit is at stake. In our tradition, we are anchored by our principles, a reverence for the interconnected web of all beings and a responsibility to be fair and just in our relationships to create a system that is just. And when we exist in a system that is unjust, some refer to this as a sort of spiritual fragmentation. It's the idea that when we are not in right relationship with others in that web, we are not in right relationship with our spirit. When balance and equity does not exist among parts of the whole, we ourselves are not whole. We are, in a sense, not fully alive. That is why 
in the book Soul Work, UU Minister Rebecca Parker says this. Social activism becomes a spiritual practice by which I reclaim my humanity. I struggle neither as a benevolent act of social concern nor as a repentant act of shame and guilt, but as an act of desire for life. Spiritually speaking, we have everything at stake. And the social transformation we so desperately need requires a spiritual transformation. So how do we do this? A few minutes ago, we heard the story of the two villages beside the river. And the moral of the story is that we cannot merely address the pain caused by the system. We need to seize the opportunity to change the system, especially in years like this year, especially when the moment is right. Because when we only address the pain caused by the system and not try to dismantle it, we are all but ensuring the system's survival. Those privileged among us do not need to buy into these systems. We do not need to agree with these systems in order to reap the benefits of them. All we have to do to maintain the system is, well, nothing. And if we exert all our energy addressing the symptoms, we will never break the cycle. That is why we must go up river. But here's another piece of wisdom from that story. It's the kids. The girl in that story asks, why are people falling in the river? Why is this happening? And upon realizing the cause, found a way to get all the parents of the village up to the top the upriver village to build a fence that broke the cycle. We also have kids like that in our unfolding story. The teenage survivors of the Parkland shooting who organized the march for our lives. Climate activists, Greta Thunberg, Time Magazine's Person of the Year. She just turned 17 on Friday, by the way. Happy birthday, Greta. These kids, like the kids in the story, they're saying, it doesn't need to be this way. It can't be this way anymore. These kids are dreaming big and willing the creation of a better world. And I would be remiss if I did not mention the Sunrise Movement, who are the true driving force behind the Green New Deal, the most comprehensive plan our country has to address climate change is being fueled by a movement of 20-year-olds and 16-year-olds, and no joke, nine-year-olds. But to be fair, their executive director is 24. <laughs> This is a broad coalition of both urban and rural youth whose communities are some of the most vulnerable to the effects of climate change. And what I love most about them is that these youth are students of history. They are studying suffrage and the civil rights era and the original New Deal. And they are building a movement based on the scholarship of Harvard professor Erica Chenoweth. Dr. Chenoweth's research shows that no major movement in 120 years has ever failed once it achieved to activate and sustain the participation of 3.5% of the population. 3.5%. That is the tipping point. 
and they are building a pathway to that magic number. They're nine years old. Like, they were born in 2011. <laughs> and I mean, I know I'm young. I'm 32. But to some of these kids, I'm like a millennial version of grandma. I mean, <laughs> at the edge of the generation, I still watch movies on VHS. <laughs> Actually, I just got a new VHS player for Christmas. <laughs> but I did this. These kids are literally trying to save the world. They are protesting in the streets. They are occupying the offices of politicians. They are demanding change. And they need our help. They need each and every one of us to get to that 3.5% tipping point. Of course, there are adults who are also building mass movements. Leaders in our country whose great gifts are that they dream as big as kids do. North Carolina's very own Reverend Dr. William Barber, leader of the Moral Monday movement, comes to mind. This is a man that we all study in seminary. Possibly the best example of a prophetic liberal religious voice in our country today and he is in our backyard. Almost exactly one month from today on Saturday, February 9th, he will be leading the moral march in Raleigh called HK on J, or Historical Thousands on Jones Street. Who's been to HK on J here? And then he will be continuing to travel across the country rallying support for the big event the Poor People's March in Washington, D.C. on June 20th. The aspirations for this event is to achieve a march on Washington at a scale that has not been seen since Dr. King. <clears throat> Reverend Barber has his eye on the tipping point. Yes, we have got to continue addressing the pain caused by oppressive systems. And I know that this church is doing a lot of that. But we've also got to give equal, if not more, effort, especially in this important year, to change the system. We have got to move outside the walls of this church, outside the context of this denomination, and make a very small but essential contribution to something that is very, very big. We have got to believe in the tipping point. There's a sense in which, for many of us, this is not a time to lead. This is a time to follow. And for those of us who are privileged, this is a time to follow the lead of those who are most affected by systems of oppression, by those who have the most at stake. Earlier we heard Eric Bannon perform the song Blowing in the Wind, a song that stirred the hearts of so many and moved people to action the last time a justice movement changed this country. I was watching old YouTube videos of that song this week and came across a video of Mary Travers of the group Peter, Paul, and Mary talking about her experience performing that song at the 1963 March on Washington. And she said this. I started to sing and I had an epiphany. Looking out at a quarter of a million people, for the first time I truly believed in that moment that it was possible for human beings to join together 
to create positive social change. Until that moment, even Peter, Paul, and Mary doubted that change was possible. And that same doubt hangs in this room right now. It lives in me. It lives in all of us. How could it not? But that doubt did not stop Peter, Paul, and Mary. It didn't stop Dr. King. Call it imagination. Call it idealism. Call it faith. How many deaths will it take? So we know that too many people have died. When will we finally rise up to demand that we all have access to health care and a dignified wage, a fair democracy, an inhabitable earth? How long until we reach the tipping point? We hold the answer to that question. We are the answer to that question. Because together, we are more powerful than we can even imagine. May this year be the tipping point. And may we be able to say that we were a part of it. Amen.